Hello, everybody, and welcome to what has become a weekly feature here in terms of online offerings from Cooperstown, New York, site of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. It is our virtual curator spotlight. Today, we will take a look back at baseball in the 19th century, our exhibit, Taking the Field, the 19th century, located on the museum's second floor. And joining us to discuss that will be Eric Stroll, who has been with us several times before. Eric is our vice president of exhibitions and collections, and he'll break down this exhibit. We'll take a look at some of the artifacts that are featured, some very interesting artifacts uh, visually and also in terms of the stories behind them. And we'll do all that with Eric in just a couple of moments. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Bruce Markison. I'm not a curator, but I do work in the education department and glad to have a chance to talk to Eric and some of uh, his other curators on his staff over these past several weeks. Uh, today, we will focus in on baseball in the 19th century. Uh, our museum is currently closed, but when it does reopen sometime later this summer, uh, and you don't, let's say you happen to come to Cooperstown, we hope you can in the summer or the fall, if you go up the stairs to the second floor, one of the first exhibits that you're going to see is this one called Taking the Field, 19th Century Baseball. Uh, with us to go through a virtual tour of this exhibit is Eric Stroll. Eric, thanks once again for being with us. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Bruce. Uh, thanks for having me. And I think this is the, the fourth one I've done with you. And uh, it's always exciting. It's a little bit different not doing these, um, you know, walking through the museum with, with crowds of people. But we actually get to reach more people doing it this way. So uh, that's not a bad trade-off. And, um, yeah, I enjoy doing this and, and letting people understand kind of what goes on behind the scenes and making an exhibit and in the thought process and you know the, the visitors see only the final product and, and they don't realize the year and a half uh, or longer that it takes to to produce an exhibit from the moment you conceive of it to brainstorming what should be in it to deciding the artifacts the images the layout how it'll be fabricated and installed so it's a, a complex process of which um, everyone really just sees the last part a lot of the exhibits that we have looked at in previous shows, relatively recent within the last 10 years, some within the last five years. This one is a little bit older. It goes back to 2004. And here we have the ribbon cutting ceremony that took place uh, that day for this exhibit. Uh, among the folks featured here, uh, Ted Spencer, your predecessor, he was the prior chief curator of the Hall of Fame. Now our Curator Emeritus still comes into the office quite a bit. Uh, we have uh, Chairman of the Board, Jane Forbes-Clark, uh, our former President, Dale Petrosky, among those that took part in the ribbon cutting. Eric, you're not in the photograph, but you were there that particular day back in 04. What do you remember about it? Well, it was one of the first uh, exhibits that we had opened after I had started. I began in 98 and then we spent a lot of time getting our national traveling exhibit together, which uh, took a whole number of years, and that that began in uh, 2002. So after we we spent a lot of time on that, we came back to the museum and said, "Okay, so what's going to be the next thing we're going to work on here?" And it, we decided it really needed to be early baseball and redo what had been uh, just a really small part of the old timeline. Um, so it was a fun day. It's a little bit different when you're opening an exhibit about something that nobody experienced or lived through that's present. Um, so, you know, you're kind of doing a little bit more teaching than it is uh, something that people, um, you know, learned about or got to see or got to watch, um, you know, in the present. So it was a fun day and we had a bunch of dignitaries um, available to us and, you um, I remember working on this exhibit, like all of our exhibits, we do it as a committee and um, all the curators get different sections with a lead curator kind of managing the whole process. So uh, some of these sections were, were mine that I worked on specifically, but when it comes together as a whole, you wouldn't know um, that there's so many people involved. On the very far left of this photograph, a gentleman named Jim Roberto. And at the time he was the mayor of Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And he has a very interesting connection to this whole story. Well, not really just 19th century baseball, but 18th century baseball. Yeah. So, you know, when we're preparing to do this exhibit, um, the, the first part of it, and we'll get to that in a moment, 
talks about early bat and ball games um, around the world. Um, and then, of course, bat and ball games um, in the United States and the use of the term baseball when it first shows up. Uh, the word baseball first arrives in print in England in a book called The Pretty Little Pocket Book. It was a, a kid's book. And it's the first time the word baseball ever appeared in print. That was 1744. Uh, and then there had been the, you know, the earliest um, American reference in print to the word baseball. Well, as we were about to open this exhibit was in the last month, I think, leading up to the opening, uh, relatively soon. It wasn't too far away. Uh, the date got moved back on the earliest mention of the word baseball in America. And it ended up being in Pittsfield. They found um, in Pittsfield bylaws, they found um, a bylaw that prohibited the playing of baseball near the town meeting house. Uh, and it's kind of funny because when you're thinking about baseball, the first American mention is, is basically uh, a statement forbidding them to do so. Um, the reason being the glass is very expensive, windows are very expensive, and baseball breaks windows. And so they were forbidding kids from playing baseball. Uh, whatever that term meant then, it is not the game we knew necessarily today. And that was in 1791. Now, in between Jane Clark and Dale Petrosky, a gentleman named Charles Donovan, and he the son of a 19th century star, Patsy Donovan. So Charles was involved in the ceremony as well. Yeah, we were looking for somebody who had a direct connection to a 19th century ball player. And I couldn't, I didn't even remember he was there, honestly. This is what, 16 years ago? Yeah. Um, but uh, when I saw that, I remembered. And that, that's, that's awesome. The other lady that is in the middle there next to Jane is Jamie Bartholomew. And she's the daughter of Bill Bartholomew, the former owner of the Braves. And her connection is, of course, if you look at, and, and we'll talk more about this as we move forward through this discussion, um, the Braves could be called the, the only franchise in baseball history that's fielded a, a team, the same franchise since baseball began, since pro baseball began in 1871. The Boston Red Stockings, of course, uh, of the National Association become the Boston Red Stockings in the National League. Um, become the Boston Braves, become the Milwaukee Braves, become the Atlanta Braves. So um, they were um, people that helped out, helped fund the uh, exhibit, and that was the connection there. Now, when people first walk into the exhibit, they come up those stairs, and then they walk a short way through the hallway. This is the first view of taking the field, uh, and it's decorated in a very interesting way. We see the World Series bunting, uh, at least that's what I call it. Uh, but the wallpaper also for this exhibit, that was a major part of the project. Yeah, we wanted to lend an environment that let people feel like they were going back to the 19th century. And that's part of what you do in exhibits is not just um, teach information and show artifacts and graphics, but try to immerse people in an environment that you create to give them a sense of time and place. So we actually had the wallpaper done at the Farmers Museum, which is another museum in Cooperstown. It's a living history kind of farm with buildings moved from all over upstate New York, all period buildings. Uh, the, the, the Farmers Museum is set in the period of the 1840s. The building, buildings range larger, uh, larger span than that. And they have an American paper staining manufactory there. And so the wallpaper that was used to coat the walls in this exhibit was made over at the Farmers Museum using period tools, um, using woodblock prints, cotton fiber paper, and distemper paints. And there's a, a label to that effect in the exhibit. There's also a soundtrack that runs um, while you're in there. And what we did was found sheet music, 19th century sheet music, and there was tons and tons of music being written about baseball in the late 19th century. Um, and we had uh, people play that on period instruments and then record that, and then that is what's being heard um, through the audio. Let's dive a little deeper into the exhibit. Here is the introductory panel. And this shows us that, well, baseball really didn't just start in the 19th century. We tend to associate that as an important period of time, and it's certainly a time when it became popular in America. But in fact, bat and ball games go back thousands of years before. Right, and I think we need to make a distinction between what we call baseball today and bat and ball games that may have been called baseball in the past, which have been played by, by various different rules. But let's suffice it to say that since, you know, humans have been around and picked up rocks and sticks, um, there's been a form of, 
of batting something that is pitched uh, towards you. Um, that one image, <coughs> excuse me, that is, um, do you have a closer up? There you go, Bruce. Um, that looks like the wall of an Egyptian tomb is in fact a, a colorized version of what it would have looked like. And, you know, when we see images of Egyptian tombs, there is no color, but there would have been color at the time they were done. And that's the 14th century BC, I believe, from Thutmose the Third. And it's picturing them playing a bat and ball game called Sakur Hemat, which was uh, used during a religious ritual. So there's uh, you know, an example of bat and ball games being played uh, in the BC era. The one below that um, is from um, a manuscript that comes from Spain in the 13th century, about 1250 AD, um, showing young boys playing ball in a meadow, if you um, translated it. And so there's uh, two very old antecedents. Of course, baseball and bat and ball games in the United States um, start off um, again, basically as soon as we arrive in this country, kids are playing bat and ball games. And there's also, there's one old cat and there's things that were derived from rounders, similar to rounders uh, that they had played in England. Um, and you know, various different kids games with bats and balls. And then when you get into the, eight, uh, the 1800s, um, you start to see things more similar to what we would now call baseball in terms of various different games um, that are competing at the same time, basically using slightly different rules, but being played differently in different regions of the United States. Um, and then one of those versions eventually wins out and becomes baseball that we, we would recognize today. Now, there are two very early references to a game of baseball, two separate words. One of them was in Great Britain, and then the other later in America. Tell us about those two. Yeah, as we said in the intro, one was the Little Pretty Pocketbook, and that was the first mention of the word baseball in the English language, and that came in England in 1744. And then you have the Pittsfield Bylaws, which are the first now, the, the oldest known reference to the word baseball in print in America. Um, but that'll get pushed back, I'm sure. You know, that's part of history. Um, it, we tend to think of history as static, but if you talk to any historian, they will tell you that it's constantly ongoing. You're constantly rediscovering things that had been lost to um, the current, um, you know, people that are currently alive today, and, and they're rediscovered. So I would not be surprised uh, at some point in the next five to ten years, you see um, that reference uh, in America get pushed back prior to 1791. What about this separation of the two words? How long did that go on for? So baseball is two words. That's how you predominantly see it in the, in the 1800s. When you get to the 20th century, uh, basically from 1900 to 1920, it becomes kind of both ways. You'll see it both ways. And it's interesting to run if you're able to, to um, search newspapers um, with a lot of the tools that they have online now, right? You can actually perform your own experiment, experiments and type in baseball as one word or two words, see how many different hits you get on the mm -hmm. time periods that you put in. Once you get to the teens, uh, basically, the teens, 1920, baseball is almost entirely one word. And um, so it's really about the turn of the century you see the change. One of my favorite visual parts of this exhibit is this uh, display featuring uh, gold baseballs. I have the word gold in quote. They're not solid gold. It's a kind of a gold leaf that's been put, a uh, gold paint has been put on the exterior of the baseballs. We're going to get to the gold part in a moment, but it's interesting how this team, prominent team, the Eckford Baseball Club, this is how we refer to these early teams, not as teams, but as club. Can you explain exactly what the word club signifies? Sure, and, and you know, it's, it's, I think it's a very important distinction to make when I'm talking about baseball in the 19th century to people and, and um, trying to get them to understand how, how it worked and, and how things ran. You know, we, we use that term pretty much exclusively in baseball, right? We, we don't talk about clubs in, in, in football, really, or basketball or hockey. They're teams, right, that go to locker rooms. In baseball, they're clubs that go to clubhouses. And that's because baseball started as social clubs, actual gentlemen's clubs, uh, where you elected officers, you paid dues. I mean, what a novel idea, right? You're paying to play baseball. It couldn't be more opposite than it is today, where... You know, baseball is a multi-billion dollar um, entity um, where we are paying players large amounts of money. And if you're a very good a ball player, insane amounts of money comparatively to what the average person makes. 
Um, you flip that around 180 degrees, and that's what you have in the 19th century. Baseball is a club sport, and, and that time of, of, the, of American history is very much a, a history of joining. American were joiners, right? They joined clubs of all sorts. So, um, you know, whether it was a fireman's club or different social clubs, um, uh, that is what happened. And so that's how baseball starts. It starts as a club where, like I said, you're, you're electing officers, you're paying dues, you, you have a constitution and bylaws that talk about modes of conduct and behavior, um, you know, no cursing, for example, and you can't be late and, and all sorts of things to try to, to keep people in line. Um, and then inside these, um, these manuals, you would also have the rules of the game. So the earliest, actually the earliest artifacts that we have at the Hall of Fame, some of them are rule books that come from as early as 1854. Um, that talk about the club and how you elect the officers and what the dues are and, and then the rules of the game. So, you know, that's how clubs work. And the most famous club is, the, is really the first baseball club that was formed is the Knickerbocker Baseball Club, which was uh, formed in 1845. And they were the first to write down rules to what had been a children's game, right? Kids don't really write down rules. Kids show up and they play with however kids show up and they adapt the rules to the space and the number of people available. Um, but you start to see this stuff being written down and now men are beginning to play it. So it's becoming different than just a, a, a child's game. Industrialization of America is also providing routine um, because you go to work and there's so many hours for work and there's so many hours for leisure. Um, now remember there's no light. So um, a lot of people still have to work during the day, but at least you're providing this framework for people to gather and play baseball. And it's really for the idea of healthy, honest competition and exercise um, to get out there and do something that, that, that they all enjoy. Um, the idea was not to, to make money. Let's go back to the Eckford club. Uh, how good were they and what's the significance of all these gold baseballs? Yeah, the Eckford Club, uh, one of the, the most famous clubs of, of that period of the 1850s and 60s. They were founded, I think, in 1855, and they were laborers at the Eckford and Webb uh, shipyard in Brooklyn. And what you see there is one of the most fantastic artifacts that we have in the Hall of Fame. We received it in uh, 1939, the year that we opened. And what you see in there are about 150 baseballs, trophy balls from games that were actually played by the Brooklyn Eckfords. Most of those are from games in the 1860s. Now, back then you, you used one ball in a game. You know, you started the game, you played the game with one ball and that's all you had. If the ball went down a hole or disappeared, you know, play was halted until the ball was located and then play was resumed. So it's nothing like today where you're changing the ball all the time. And it's actually, you know, it, it's at one point it's written into the rules that the team who who um, wins the game gets to keep the game ball. So they would do is they would take these balls back to their clubhouses, which are real places that they socialized. You know, that word gets transferred then mm -hmm. later to the ballpark as the, as the, in essence, the locker room where kids, where people get prepared, but actually was a physical location in which the club met. And these balls um, are then decorated and either painted gold or covered in gold leaf and uh, we call them trophy balls today, and they're um, adorned with the score of the game. And these are all games in which they won because the winning team gets to keep the ball. And um, that is really what greets you when you come in the exhibit. It's, a, it's fantastic. I don't have a close-up of the balls. We're limited on, on some of the imagery we can access uh, being away from the museum. Um, but it is, if you look at them, the scores are something that would strike you. And and I spend a lot of time in this room when I do orientations with the new Hall of Famers. So when they come in for the orientation to, to, to learn about the Hall of Fame, and we spend a lot of time here because they don't know a lot about older, the older game. And when you look at the scores, I mean, they're crazy. There's, there's games where there's 20, 30, 40, 50 runs scored in a game, um, which was very common uh, back then. So, you know, that's one difference, of course, between baseball then and baseball now. Uh, there's various reasons for that. Um, and, you know, I don't want to go too down, far down the rabbit hole, but the things like what's fair and what's foul territory for much of the 19th century, if a ball started fair, no matter where it went after that, it's considered a fair ball. You know, today, if it goes foul before the first or third base backs, it becomes a foul ball. So there were people adept at, at shooting the ball off their bat right inside the fair, you know, right inside fair territory, and then it would scoot off into foul territory, and that's a fair ball. 
of course, there's no, no strikes are not counted. Foul balls are not strikes. Um, and then there's no equipment, no protective equipment of any kind, at least, right? Um, so the catcher's not wearing anything that you can see that's protective. We'll talk a little bit more about equipment. And then uh, there's no gloves. So certainly without gloves and playing barehanded, it's going to be a little bit different uh, playing, playing defensively. So you'll see these large scores. One thing to note is that um, there are a couple rules in the 19th century that I like to talk about that were, the, that were rules that went, the Knickerbockers played with. And, and those rules they, they wrote in 1845 have really are the antecedent for the game that we play today. Um, one of them is the length of a game. You know, we always consider baseball, I think, being a, a nine inning game, right? And, and baseball's got this, this thing with numbers, lots of threes um, and nines come into that. Um, and so you, I think we all think baseball's a nine inning game, but that is not the case as written in the rules of the Knickerbockers and as played for the first dozen years or so up until up through 1858, baseball was a game of 21. It was the team who scored 21 runs first, provided they each had the name, number of sides at bat won the game and they scored so many runs back then the games would often last less than nine innings this is again prior to 1858 once you get to that um that time frame um which is uh timing for the first real convention um of the national association of baseball players which is the first governing body of baseball amateur baseball they decide to make the game nine innings um so that's one thing that people don't realize i think and then another is the the bound out we think of baseballs being hit on the fly having to be caught on the fly to be out uh, but all the way up into 1865 you could catch a ball on one bounce uh, mm. in fair territory and uh, it was still considered an out so um, when i talk about that with uh, pitchers former pitchers of the game of course they're a little rueful that uh, that rule is not the sun, not the same as it used to be now tell us about this silver ball which is part of the knickerbocker story that was a ball given to a, um, a gentleman named uh, Kissam, and he was, it was his 25th anniversary of being in the Knickerbocker Club. And I believe he joined in 1854. So that was about eight, that's from about 1879. It was given to him by his, by his club mates to commemorate his 25th anniversary in the club. So that's um, really a neat piece. And we have a lot of commemorative, what we would call trophy items besides trophy ball, trophy bats and and all sorts of other things that are mementos of the games uh, and of membership in clubs. Above that though, you also see, um, there's a photograph there and that is, and you can't see it very well, so apologize for that, but that's the oldest known on-field photograph of teams taken together. And that is indeed the New York Knickerbockers and the Brooklyn Excelsiors, the first team in Brooklyn um, in 1859. So that's the oldest on-field uh, photograph that we know to exist. And that's a panoramic shot, right? Yeah, they're all standing, uh, right, the two teams are standing next to each other on the field. Interesting. Another very interesting item, this is one that we actually spotlight in our virtual field trips that we do for students and school groups. Uh, we talk about this uh, Baraboo, Wisconsin team, uh, the Hall of Fame fortunate to have. Um, not only this is the oldest uniform in the collection, but it is believed to be the oldest baseball uniform, period. At least it's the only one we know of. Tell us a little bit more about Baraboo in this 1866 jersey. Yeah, so first of all, it's a, you know, this is the circa the end of the Civil War. So the fact that um, that's something like that still exists is, is amazing. Um, you can see that there's a cap there above it. And then down on the deck below the bat, lying horizontal, is the belt. Belts were very big parts of uniforms, um, and every team had their own distinctive belts that went along with um, the uniforms that they wore. And that is a bib front uniform. You can't see it because of the lighting there. And again, apologies to those that are watching that these aren't the most ideal photographs, but um, there is a, an old English B. I think a lot of people come in and think it's Boston uh, because it definitely looks like an old uh, English B that, that you would associate. You think immediately when you see a B, you think Boston, but that is Baraboo, Wisconsin which also happens to be uh, the circus, like the circus capital of the world. One of the Ringling Brothers Museums is in Baraboo, Wisconsin, mm, really? interestingly enough. Um, but that's, you know, that speaks to the expansion of the game in the 1860s. In the 1850s, you know, we think of baseball as this rural pastoral game that's, that's sprouting up 
around the entire country. And the, it's really the exact, that's true. Like the exact opposite. And that is that um, baseball comes out of the city, you know, baseball sprouts really out of New York city and grows outward from there and then takes hold in other cities first. And you see that in the 1850s and then it spreads in the 1860s um, to, to most everywhere else in America. Um, so by that point, I mean, you start seeing the first games, uh, teams on the West coast in the late 1850s and, um, by the 1860s, baseball's everywhere. And so it's kind of interesting out of all the artifacts we have, and so many of them are Northeastern centric, um, because particularly in the early part of our existence, um, it seemed natural that people that were geographically close were, were donating artifacts from us. And the history of baseball, the oldest history of baseball, um, you know, really focuses on the Northeast, but you know, the oldest uniform we have comes from Wisconsin. So that's kind of neat. We have elaborate belts. We have long sleeves. We also have something called a shield. Tell us about that. Yes, that's a bib front, right? And it looks like a shield. And that's very much kind of like based on what firemen um, um, uniforms would have been for firemen's clubs. And um, mm -hmm. that was very much uh, the popular, one of the popular trends in terms of that look at the time. Here we look at another part of the exhibit. And, you know, certainly the red, white, and blue bunting, something that we would associate with the World Series in the 20th century, but apparently goes back to the 19th century. This part of the exhibit looks at the growth of baseball, uh, the expanding popularity, as we say here, the national craze. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there's a bunch of things going on um, that are making baseball popular. When you, in, in 1850, um, cricket's more popular than baseball. By the time we get to 1860, uh, baseball has blown it away. Um, so you're really starting to see things change in the 1850s. And by 1860s, baseball's really becoming popular, um, almost to the point of a national craze. By the time you get to the, by the 1880s, it's a full-blown mania uh, in this country. So there's a, a number of factors. One is the fact that we're not restricting who can play baseball by skill. Um, you know, obviously there's still restrictions on gender and on race. Um, but for something like cricket, which seemed much more, um, uh, you know, some distinctions based on class, we were not preventing you from playing ball um, if you didn't play very well. And so clubs would have uh, what we would call the first nine or the senior nine. They would have the second nine or the junior nines, you know, in, in common parlance today, think of that maybe it's like a JV. Um, and then you would have junior clubs for younger members. And then you'd have what they called muffin nines for players um, that, uh, shall we say, had the least skill and ability. Um, so it was almost a comedy of errors, but you can find advertisements for muffin matches. And we kind of chuckle about that today because you think about the word muffin. Um, seems funny times when you're talking about breakfast, but don't underestimate how hugely important it was that we are allowing people to play the game and it, it really helps spread the growth of the game by including um, more people than you would have been including in, in other sports. Media, of course, also plays a huge role in this, as does transportation. Baseball and America grow up together. So what happens in the 19th century that transforms and changes America, industrialization uh, and the growth of the country and the change of the economy of the country from a rural economy to an industrialized one, also transforms and allows the game of baseball to become popular by helping to spread the game. So media begins to cover the game. Uh, newspapers are covering it and there's a lot more newspapers. And of course, trains allow information um, to spread and transfer where um, most people would grow up their whole lives um, not having seen uh, maybe 10, 15 miles from their house, certainly not going too far away. And so now, particularly once you have this revolution transportation, you have the game spreading far and wide um, and communities are embracing it. It becomes pop. It becomes part of community identity. Um, and so local teams uh, representing their community face off against their, their next town over sort of idea. And we see that today, right? Rampant in college in high school and college sports, but this is happening with baseball uh, in the 1800s. So the stuff on the left in that photo is talking mostly about the expansion of media. Um, then you have, um, we talk about youth baseball and baseball in college um, and baseball being played in all sorts of places. And then it's the commodification of baseball also that takes place during this time. Baseball becomes part of culture to be consumed. Um, 
So not only is it uh, is the popularity of baseball opening up new industries like sporting goods industries where you're making sporting goods equipment and things connected to that, but imbuing baseball and the imagery of baseball on any sort of product you could imagine. Um, you, can you take us to that next photo, I think, Bruce? Sure. And that shows some of that. You know, baseball, uh, of course, we talk about baseball cards. Baseball starts as as promotional stuff. Uh, cards start as promotional cards for other products, particularly tobacco in the 19th century. Um, you can see there's a board game from the 19th century, that big diamond shaped thing. Hmm. Um, there's sheet music there on the left of that photo. There's ceramic figurines. There's baseball being used on, on plates and dishware. Um, there's scrapbooks. There's uh, candlestick holders. You know, baseball and the motifs of baseball are showing up on all sorts of product and becoming, is like I said, becoming commodified. What you also see there are stereoscopes. The most people probably haven't seen stereoscopes. I call it the television of 19th century Victorian America. And we have them at two different heights there. Really what you have are, are, are an image uh, on cards that you would insert into these goggles really that you would wear. Mm -hmm. And it would um, kind of take this 2D image and layer it over each other, giving these 2D images almost a 3D feel. Um, so you can imagine a kid sitting around uh, the parlor after uh, dinner with gen different generations of the family. Um, and uh, of course, there was, these were very popular and there were all sorts of imagery, strange and exotic places from around the world and natural uh, wonders of the world and of this country. But there were also um, stereoscope images of baseball and baseball teams. So again, just another way that baseball was, was you know, being inserted into culture. Now, Eric, is that, uh, is that a, an original stereoscope or is that a reproduction? Now, we reproduced them, but um, the cards also we reproduced, but the, the images that we reproduced as graphics to be used in these um, are um, from the collection. So the actual stereoscope cards we have. Interesting. We wouldn't expose those to light now, of course. Today. Yeah. Um, here I, we have what I have rather poorly titled the brick wall. I'm sure there's a better explanation for what's going on here. Actually, this is where we talk about some of the early ballparks, um, the union grounds, and also a place called the Fashion Race Course. Um, let's start with that. What was the significance of the Fashion Race Course? So Fashion Race Course on Long Island in Queens was a place where um, obviously there was horse racing <laughs> that occurred there. But it is also uh, today probably in, the, in, in um, terms of baseball history, um, regarded as the first place at which um, baseball, a baseball game at which admission uh, was charged occurred. So in 1858, uh, and you can see a ball there. Can you move forward one, Bruce, just so for a close up and then we can come back? Yeah, sorry, it's a, a little bit out of focus. That's the, uh, the first one. They played three games there in 1858 and they were all-star teams made up of the best players from the clubs in New York City, Manhattan, uh, and the best clubs in Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn is still a separate part, a separate its own city, not part of New York City yet. And so obviously today there's still a rivalry and there was a tremendous rivalry in the 19th century. They played a series of three games, one in July, one in August, and one in September at the Fashion Race Course. Um, and the, uh, the money that was raised was given to the fire department funds of the cities um, of um, New York City and of Brooklyn. Interestingly enough, the first games at which admission was charged was uh, was to help out, um, you know, was, was basically for charity. You know, mm. we see baseball basically helping out. It's kind of neat that that's the first reason why we have an admission charge, a gate charge. Of course, in order to have a gate charge, um, you, you know, that's a surprise for people. They're not expecting to pay. It was advertised that way. It was 10 cents uh, to get in. I think it was a quarter um, with um, a horse and I believe maybe 50 cents with horse and carriage. So think of it like uh, entry and parking uh, in today's uh, thinking. And um, so those games are, are most famous for, for that. If you can go back, Bruce, to that last image, of course, what becomes important and we're, what we're really talking about now is the transition from amateur baseball to professional baseball. Those early clubs we're talking about don't have owners, right? Nobody's being paid to play. Nobody's being charged to watch. Again, it was about the the clubs themselves and the socialization and the hot and the and the competition. Um, 
when you start to transfer to professionalism, it is America after all, right? Capitalism is king. In order to do that, you need to enclose ballparks. Um, and when you enclose a ballpark, now you, can get, now you can charge admission more easily to get in. The first ballpark that was built for baseball was the Union Grounds in Brooklyn in 1862. And that's an image there of that. Um, and that's really turning a corner in, the, in, in baseball history by, um, you know, basically leading to, to this point. So now, as we transition to professionalism, what you're going to see is, is teams that decide that, uh, there we go, it's a good segue, Bruce, to the Cincinnati Red Stockings. <coughs> Excuse me. So this area is talking about baseball as business. Um, and you can't do that without talking about the Cincinnati Red Stockings. So 1869 is a pivotal year in baseball history. We talked about the first convention of, of the governing body being in 1858, and they struggled with professionalism for a decade. Um, there was there was always there was always kind of professionalism going on under the table, so to speak. Um, the best players were perhaps given jobs, a salary for a job that they did not uh, actually go to, um, or were given place to live rent free, um, or, or different ways were found to pay players. But paying players openly was forbidden. Uh, they thought that money would ruin the game. It would make it about it would make it about money, um, and gambling would get involved rather than about the competition. So they very much struggled with this. But it became apparent that it was happening, and they really couldn't stop it. So finally. And it's a lot more complicated to this, but to, to keep things simple, uh, in 1869, the National Association of Baseball Players finally agreed for the first time to allow teams to play as professional if they wanted. Now, we often talk about the Cincinnati Red Stockings as being the first openly paid professional team. They were one of a number of teams that year that did that, but they're the most famous. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the reason because be, being what they accomplished. Now, other things are going on in 1869. Now, the team, of course, has the Wright brothers. I call them the other Wright brothers, not the ones from Dayton um, and, and the history of flight. Um, but the Wright brothers that are in the Hall of Fame, Harry and George Wright, were on this team. And um, the team is, you know, made up of, uh, of guys that are some of the best players um, that they could, they could attain. And they go undefeated in 1869. There's some other things about the team that make them very special. You know, 1869 is the year that the Transcontinental Railroad's completed and they drive the, the Golden Spike in Utah. So now for the first time, you have a team playing in the East Coast of the United States and the West Coast of the United States in the same calendar year. They're the first team to do that. So although we call them the Cincinnati Red Stockings, they're playing a vast majority of their games on the road and they would go on an Eastern road trip and they'd come back and play in Cincinnati for a while. Then they'd go on a Western road trip and they'd come back and they'd go on other little satellite road trips and they'd come back. Um, but if, you know, basically if you look at the tally of games that they played, they played what were considered about 57 national association games, teams that were in the national association and went undefeated 57 games. Um, if you start counting other games, um, cause they would play teams that weren't part of the association more what we would can think of as pickup games, uh, now against basically all comers. Um, you know, their, their, their record was, could have been considered up into the 80s in terms of games they won without losing. Over the course of two years in 1869 and 1870, they probably won about 120 games and lost about four or five. So, you know, what this is doing is showing other large cities, of course, um, what happens if you have openly paid all professional team and you're paying quality players to play. Um, you know, when you do this, you're now kind of, you're, you're crossing that threshold of which there's no return, uh, really, yeah. that threshold of professionalism. So you're now paying players to play. When you get better players because you're paying them, you're going to win more. And when you win more and enclose a stadium, you can now charge people to watch. And baseball takes on an entirely new life of its own by becoming um, professionalized and becoming uh, connected with business, right? So now baseball, although it had become a business in other ways in terms of the merchandise and, and the other um, associated things arising out of the playing of the game, the game itself now becomes a business. Um, and so that's kind of what this talks about. And 69 and 70 of the Cincinnati Red Stockings, it is extremely expensive to travel around the country and play. Um, 
and it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. They end up with a profit of less than $2 after only two years. And mm-hmm. although they're unbelievably successful, that the, they disband. And the Wright brothers take a couple of the other guys from that team, and they go and they form the Boston Red Stockings in Boston, which, as we said, become the Boston Braves, which is, which is today's Atlanta Braves, and join the National Association, which becomes the first professional major league um, of baseball. And that's from 1871 to 75. And you get teams from New York and you get teams from Philadelphia and you have teams from um, Washington and Chicago and Troy and some other places that we would consider smaller places, smaller cities today. Um, And that's a team run league though. Hmm. Okay. The teams are in charge of, of what's going on. And basically there's a lot of contract jumping. People are not playing um, uniform schedules. And it's really a mess in terms of its organization. Some historians would argue that they would don't even consider it a professional major league because of all the issues. Um, I think there's some consensus and and the Hall of Fame would agree that, um, you know, we kind of consider all things and and for them, for even though it had those issues, we would consider it a professional major league. Things really turn the corner in 1876 when you have the creation of the National League, which is now an owner controlled league. And so they shore up all those things that have problems, right? They start charging a standard admission. They start enforcing contracts. They institute what we end up calling the reserve clause, which means the player becomes a a team's piece of property in essence, and is not able to choose where he plays of his own free will. Um, They basically, as businessmen and owners, imbue business ideals onto what was an amateur game. Um, They are management and baseball players become the labor And they play the game that becomes the product that is then bought by the consumer, the viewer, uh, or the fan in the seat. So, you know, it's the story of 19th century America, really, um, of that time being being looked at as a microscope in terms of baseball. You get another league, the American Association, which begins in 1882. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Before we go there. We got yet a couple other images. Here's some Cincinnati Red Stockings. That's 1869. So this is Harper's Weekly, obviously a very famous uh, newspaper of the time, showing um, a woodcut of the team from 1869. So baseball, it isn't just a sporting um, periodical. This is an, uh, a, a, a periodical read far and wide by people all over the country. So baseball, you know, is getting getting its payday, so to speak, getting its coverage. The and Eric, just like, 10 players, that's it? Yep. Mm-hmm. That's the whole team, wow. Yep. Pretty hard to believe now. And, and Harry Wright was the manager, but he could he would also play. You know, basically have one guy for each position. And the same guy would pitch every game. Asa Brainerd, for the most part, you'd have breaks. And other guys could play different positions. They could rotate. But that was the there was basically a standard lineup that they fielded. Nothing like what we would think about today. This is them returning from the Eastern Road Trip. And they actually arrived back, although this is dated July 24th. You can see that at the bottom there. That's when it was printed in Harper's Weekly. Um, but they returned around the 4th of July to Cincinnati after, uh, after an Eastern road trip. Mm-hmm. And um, a, a local a company there created a 27-foot-long baseball bat to commemorate their mm-hmm. successful Eastern road trip. Um, and um, they were greeted with this after they arrived back in, in town. Um, and it was it was driven out in a wagon and was all part of the ceremonies um, before the games that they played when they returned in Cincinnati. But again, they, they were treated like like returning heroes. Um, really, uh, were a sensation nationally, and so this town, the city of Cincinnati, embraced that. Uh, and really, um, you know, this team was the first famous team in baseball history, and, and one that we would say uh, people could describe as created a mania surrounding it. And, and it really is proper that they are on that cusp between the switch from amateurism to professionalism. Now we have a Cincinnati franchise in the American Association. Uh, we have a, a color picture here. And even though they're all wearing different colored uniforms, they're all on the same team. Explain that. <laughs> yeah. So that is from the American Association, which was a rival league that springs up to face the National League. So the National League's mostly a Northeastern League for the most part. And the American Association begins in 1882. It lasts for a decade through 1891. And it is, it's got a few major differences from the National League. So first of all, admission in the National League is 50 cents. Admission to American Association games is 25 cents. There are no games played on Sunday. 
in the National League, but they play baseball games on Sunday in the American Association, which is a huge deal uh, because people aren't working, right? But you had the Sabbath, so they they, they considered that you shouldn't play baseball. And so that's why it wasn't being played in the National League. Um, they also served alcohol at games, which was not available at National League games, which sometimes um, leads to the nickname for the American Association and to be the Beer and Whiskey League. Now, there are some reasons, uh, cultural reasons for all this. A lot of the, the teams in the American Association are teams like from, from cities like Cincinnati, Louisville, Pittsburgh, uh, teams with large immigrant popula populations. Um, which coincide uh, actually with, uh, with uh, populations that drink a lot of beer, for example. Um, and so it's not a surprise that you're seeing this introduced in, in, in the American Association. Back to the photo, what's cool about that is, uh, well, really, it's, it's, it's an anomaly. So in 18, uh, it might have been that first year, in 1882, they decide they're going to do something different. And they're going to color code uniforms by position. So, and I can't remember what it is. For argument's sake, let's say, you know, vertical uh, stripes are um, the shortstop and a solid maroon is left field and a, and a green is right field. And that all teams would follow this code. Um, they were quickly derided as clown costumes in the press and people were very confused because they couldn't tell necessarily when you have, once you have runners on base, what's going on and who's on the, on the same team. So, um, you know, baseball's filled with innovation. <laughs> You see it all the time in the 19th century. And we'll talk about that as we get to the end of this presentation shortly regarding equipment. Uh, equipment and rules are, are tinkered with all the time. And you see this and it's a history of baseball and you see things that are tinkered with and then I get adopted. But you also see it with things that they attempted that were abysmal failures and you never see again. This is, this is just one of them. That, of course, we colored that ourselves. Um, you know, using modern computer program based on what we knew the color code scheme was. We know who those players are. We know what position they played. Uh, so we could color code it um, based on what the, what the uh, rules stipulated. But um, yeah, I find that fun. Yeah, absolutely. The next three slides are going to deal with the aforementioned equipment changes. Here's kind of a broader view. Tell us what we see here. All right. So equipment in, in, the 19th century uh, is something that you don't see much of at all originally. We talked about this when you first play baseball, right? They're going out there, they have a uniform on, they got shoes on, they got, uh, you're using a bat and a ball. There is no protective equipment that you can see of any kind. No gloves, no masks for the catcher, no chest protector, no shin guards, um, nothing like that. Um, and so, you see an evolution in equipment as the as the rules change during the 19th century, um, and as concerns for, as rules change, there's concerns for safety. Um, so, on the upper left there, you can see gloves. You know, we mentioned nobody wears gloves from the beginning of baseball uh, that we would call baseball today in the 1840s until probably the late 1870s. Um, there's uh, there's accounts in newspapers of, of guys showing up with playing with flesh cover, colored gloves so that you couldn't tell they were wearing gloves. Um, mm -hmm. They certainly would have been treated poorly by fans. Um, you know, men do not protect themselves. This is, again, this is a Victorian America. Children protect themselves, men do not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it was not considered manly to wear a glove and protect your hands. And when gloves develop, they are not a tool for catching. They're really protection, right? You're not, you're still needing two hands to catch something. So the first player that's going to have gloves are, are catchers, and they're going to be fingerless mitts, almost like driving gloves of today, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really just a front and a back and a front and a back palm. Then eventually you get a full fingered glove for the hand in which the catcher is receiving, but their dominant hand in which they throw is still um, left as exposed. So the fingers, um, you can throw better that way. You see this, then move to the other out to the infielders and then to the outfielders. So, Gloves then become full fingered gloves for everybody. And slowly you get to the early 20th century, you'll see a little webbing, right? And then slowly this webbing becomes a hinge and then the whole gloves becomes a hinge. The gloves we would recognize today as baseball gloves are really things you start to see in the, in the 40s and 50s based on, based on the design where the, 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 the catcher, where the glove is a tool for catching. Whereas early on, it's just a glove to protect. Um, yeah, you have a close-up one there, Bruce. So chest protectors are introduced in 1884. You might see there's a little valve stem sticking out of the um, what is the left-hand side as we're looking at it. That was an inflatable chest protector. You would blow them up mm -hmm. yourself by just blowing into it. 
Um, shoes didn't change much. Um, once you get to the 1880s, shoes don't change really at all uh, for a long, long time after that, well into the 20th century. Um, they're kind of this high, high cleat shoes, uh, high top shoes with uh, cleats. Um, you see some old bats there. Bats, of course, become, um, you know, the rules for bats haven't changed since 1895. Um, really, there's just rules on being one complete piece of wood um, and on the length of bats and on the diameter of bats, but that's it. There's no rule, never has been a rule on the weight of bats. Um, and bats are made primarily from ash, willow, hickory. Um, and now today um, you see um, you see ash, of course, and um, and maple being the, the prime wood for bats now. The, the key thing there though, the most famous thing in that case is the Thayer catcher's mask. Right. You can see that catcher's mask, it's the one on the lower right. That's actually the patent model that was sent to the patent office. So the Thayer mask um, comes out of Harvard um, and the Harvard baseball team and their captain Thayer designed it based on a fencing mask for what would be his new catcher of the upcoming season. This is in 1878, he develops this. Um, and they, you know, it was laughed about in the press that people were putting a bird cage on their head. Um, you know, again, it was defying the, the norms of what were considered, um, you know, acceptable, uh, that you, you didn't, you didn't wear protection, but the game's rules are changing. Right. And so we're seeing things, um, but the equipment's changing and the way it's played. Um, it's becoming so da dangerous for catchers that, um, if you're going to have anybody catching at all, um, you're going to need to start protecting them. So you get the catcher's mask there in 1878, the chest protector in 1884. You get shin guards in starting in the early 20th century. Um, and you see some other examples of early catcher's masks there. So the, the history of baseball in the 19th century is, and the history of equipment is one of innovation and change um, and protection. You'll see some different balls there. One is what we would call a lemon, lemon peel ball. That's just a straight seam, and that's how all baseballs were. Um, originally, when you start seeing baseballs uh, being manufactured in the 1850s, um, you start to get to see the figure eight ball that we would call that today, where it's the two pieces of leather shaped like eight, uh, the uh, number eight uh, stitched together. And that um, you start to see those in the 1860s. You also see a seamless ball there. There's no, um, there's no seams on the outside. Certainly would have been a lot more difficult for a pitcher of today to use. Um, but what I like to point out is something that failed, uh, again, an idea that failed there in the lower right of that case is a patent. And in that patent, they're describing a bell and a base. So it's a patent for a bell and a base. And the idea was you put this at first base and it'll help the umpire, it'll give him an audio clue beyond the visual cues of his own eyes of whether a runner is, is getting to the first base bag before the ball. And on first blush, well, it seems like an interesting idea. Of course, um, when implemented, it fails, um, it fails tremendously in actual usage because you also have the first baseman touching and stepping on first base. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, what may have seemed like a great idea um, did not catch on. And that was never a, a successful piece uh, of a technology that was introduced. But you see this a lot in the 19th century, stuff that's successful and stuff that isn't. Um, a couple more topics to touch upon. Uh, we have this part of the exhibit, which focuses on the art of the pitcher, pitching the ball versus throwing the ball. What's the difference? Yeah, so I, I think that something this is lost on people. That's one of the original 20 rules of the Knickerbockers is that the ball shall be pitched and not thrown to the bat. There's a conscious decision being made in the terminologies being used and the rules and what the rules were allowing. So it's exactly what they're saying it is. Pitching means it's underhand. So until the 1880s, all pitching was done underhand in baseball. It also means you keep your arm straight at the elbow. You're not angling your arm. So it's a straight arm pitching the ball towards the bat. Um, the idea here is that the pitcher is the pitcher's role, almost in essence, is to put the ball into play. Um, and for a lot of the 19th century, batters could call where they wanted the ball pitched. I want it high, I want it low. Again, it's almost a mechanism to get the ball pitched and then the game is between the batter and the defense. But very soon, um, in any, like you can see in any competitive sport, pitchers um, want to compete, right? And so they come up with ways to um, 
to, to have a relevant impact on the game. Right, and you can still strike people out and all those things, although rules are designed and it's difficult. And, and of course, like we said, foul strikes don't count as balls till the 20th century. And there's all sorts of things. But the, where the pitcher stands and how he can move was also regulated and how he could throw was all regulated. Mm. Um, so at first, um, you could the pitcher could run, take a, basically, uh, almost like in cricket, right? You could take a, a little run and you throw underhand and you could be as close as 45 feet from the plate. Um, then they start to pin the back of where you could be. And, and beginning in the early 1860s, they create the pitcher's box, um, which is basically in use until the 90s. And, and if you ever wondered why we use that term in baseball, being knocked out of the box, it's because the pitcher actually pitched in a box. And he could move around in that box. And so pitchers could take a few steps and before they deliver the ball. And you would have, you know, these games persist all the time. You would have a hometown fielding crews knew how their pitchers liked to pitch. They also knew what visiting team would come to town and how those pitchers pitched. So they might know that the, the visiting pitcher coming to town had a, had a tendency to step on either side of that box um, or like to go as far to the line as he could. And they would build up stones around the, that part where they knew the pitcher was going to be wanting to land that plant foot. Um, you know, just games, just constant games going back and forth um, between uh, the teams in terms of, trying to one up each other when you finally get to the pitching rubber in 18 early 1890s 1892 93 um that's when you start seeing the pitcher's foot being completely anchored then in the back and you can't move you have to keep that um you have to stay basically in one position with that back foot staying on the rubber so the evolution of pitching in the 19th century is very interesting and you can see there's three images there uh, the one on the top left is a pitcher named lady baldwin uh, showing the underhand delivery Beginning in 1883, you could use side hand motions. That one's a guy named Tim Keith, the one below him. He's in the Hall of Fame. Um, and then below him is a guy named Gus Weying, who is showing an overhand delivery, which is uh, available for the, you know, it's kind of done in stages. First you underhand only, then you could go side arm, then you could finally, you know, get to the full top of an overhand motion. And that was by the late 1880s. One last slide before we start taking questions from our audience. Uh, we have a commemorative plate, part of the exhibit, and another venture into baseball and pop culture here. <laughs> right. You see things happen, uh, like we talked about, baseballs being used in all sorts of what you would call utilitarian wear, things that people use as items, day-to-day -day items in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and the reason we put this in here was to talk about changing rules. This last part talks about rule changes, and that plate depicts somebody catching a bound out, a ball bouncing on the ground and then being caught. Um, after one bounce, which, uh, as we stated, um, changes in 1865. Um, but again, using something um, that was just a household artifact, a household item to be used as an artifact in this exhibit to show how rules changed uh, in the 19th century. I think people will find it very interesting if we could transport ourselves back in time and watch a game live, what it would have looked like to us. We would recognize it as baseball for sure, um, but there'd be things about it that would be certainly foreign. We've covered a lot of ground with Eric Stroll, but we're going to continue the next few minutes with your questions. And we've already got a number of folks who have jumped in on the chat room. So <coughs> we'll take a look at um, some of the questions that have come in. Um, one of them is from Perry Barber. Perry has been watching a lot of our programs, a noted umpire. Um, she says, uh, Eric's talking about amateur men's baseball, but Perry wanted to know about women playing baseball at this time in colleges and in leagues. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So almost as soon as men are playing baseball, there's ladies that want to play baseball. There's no, you know, that's, it's a constant theme. Um, you first see the first ladies playing baseball at colleges. Um, and that's in the 19th century. Um, and very soon you, you start to see ladies even beginning to barnstorm. You have bloomer girl teams and things like that. Ladies are a part of the game, um, like I said, almost from the beginning. Now, of course, they want to get on the field and play. And we talk about that in our, in our uh, women in baseball exhibit. And we have uh, pictures of bloomer uh, girls and pictures of ladies college teams and things in there. But ladies also want to be included as fans. So you start to see ladies days that happen uh, in the 19th century. 
Um, and then the whole history of women in baseball, where, you know, women uh, in ownership and women as umpires um, and women as um, sportscasters and journalists, all of that's covered uh, in the Women in Baseball exhibit. And all of that has roots in the 19th century as well. Um, so we don't really talk about it much here in this exhibit, but Perry, thank you for asking that question because we do discuss women's role in the 19th century game and how it is, um, it comes just as really as early as, as we're talking about men's history. Um, we just gotta have to compartmentalize sometimes where things show up in exhibitry, uh, but that is definitely uh, something we talk about in the museum. Um, and appreciate you asking that question. Yeah, you know, women's yearning to be involved in the game is as early as men and starts right from, right from the beginning. The first organized women's team was actually at Vassar College, yeah. uh, which at the time was uh, an old women's college, still exists, but now is co-ed. They started in 1866. I believe they played for about 12 years, and then the club was disbanded. Uh, players wanted to keep playing, but their parents did not want their daughters playing what they felt was kind of a rough and tumble game. So against right. the players' wishes, that program was ended, and I believe it was 1878. We have a question here. Bruce, from what, one more thing there. Can I interrupt you? One more thing. Go right there. ahead. Yes. Yeah. So um, what's kind of another thing that we talk about and, and just to bring it up is, is softball. Softball starts in the 19th century as indoor baseball. Um, and then it's moved outdoors and it's become this default, right, for ladies to play softball and men to play baseball. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about that in the, in the women's exhibit. Um, and uh, I just wanted to point out that softball didn't start off as this game that was supposed to be just for women, and it has a 19th century origin. So I just wanted to bring that up very quickly sure. um, because it fits in with the 19th. And we actually have a picture of base of softball indoor. They called it indoor baseball in eight, I believe 1897. We have a question from John McNamara. I'm not sure if that's the former Red Sox and Reds manager. Uh, he says this display always a favorite of mine when I visit Cooperstown. As an Irishman, uh, one thing that really sticks out is the sign where uh, Washington is looking for ball players, but Irish need not apply. Yeah, no Irish need apply. Correct. All right, so there's a lot of stuff going on there, right? In the 19th century, we start talking about class and race, and um, and uh, where you're not just that, but where you're from, uh, what your heritage is, and baseball like many things, is very much an acculturating process, right? Immigrants um, and waves of immigrants that come, and it's a history of the 19th century, is, is a history of immigration from different countries um, around the world uh, um, coming to the United States and then finding ways to acculturate. And baseball is certainly one of them, right? So you have, um, you have cultures, whether it's first you get a lot of Irish and you get a lot of Italian, um, uh, people coming from from Ireland and Italy coming and playing this game, and when once baseball becomes professional, certainly, um, you know, you if you you get played to do ball, you're going to get the heck out of the mine or the factory or whatever that work is that you're doing, which is you know basically work that all the immigrants are, are doing this heavy manual labor for the most part. Um, so you see a lot of of, of um, immigrants that want to play baseball one because they enjoy it. Two, they can actually make money from doing it. And it's an, like I said, it's an acculturating force. So uh, kids can feel like they're becoming Americanized by playing this game of baseball and they can join in, they can fit in. And um, you, you see this repeatedly, right? And so you see a lot of Irishmen and Italians in early 19th century, or excuse me, late 19th century baseball to the point where just like you have in, in all society, you have pushback from some. You know, we want to keep it the way it is. We don't want whoever it is that's new coming in and, and injecting themselves into what we consider our own thing. And so there would be pushback. So in the 19th century, you saw pushback against Irish and Italians uh, playing baseball. Hence uh, the comment there from, from John, where you would see in newspapers, they were looking for players, but no Irish need apply. Eventually though, right, there, there becomes this more general acceptance and it becomes very common. And then you go on to the next wave. So uh, during the teens, for example, you see a lot of anti-German sentiment because of the war, mm. uh, but certainly because of World War I, but certainly you have a lot of German immigrants who are playing uh, baseball as well. So, um, you know, baseball is also a study of culture, who's allowed to play it, when they're allowed to play it. Um, and by looking at baseball, it provides you a lens to a larger cultural discussion about society in general. 
We'll take two more questions from our viewers. We have one from Jeff Kornhaas. Uh, he wants to know about the name Knickerbocker. What does that mean? Where does that word come from? I have to be honest. I can't, I, I'm not sure on the exact origin. I know it has to do with New York City, of course. Um, and let's see if I can check that for you quick. I wonder if it's short for knickers, possibly. And I should know the answer to this question, but you know, I get a lot of information up in my skull and then uh, sometimes it disappears on me. But it's obviously, it's, it's associated completely with New York City. Yeah. Uh, certainly a lot of people, sports fans, would associate it with the NBA franchise, the New York Knicks, which of course is short for New York Knickerbockers. But we'll, we'll do some follow-up research on that one. Okay, I got, I got it for you here. Yeah. Okay, I, knew what I, had to do with, I knew what I had to do with Dutch. Of course, the Dutch found New York City. So the name's derived from the Dutch word knicker, meaning marble, and baker, meaning baker. So it literally means a baker of marble. However, the term knickerbocker more popularly refers to someone descended from the early Dutch settlers of New York. So there you go. It's basically based on an, uh, a, a translation of a Dutch word. Um, and because the Dutch found in New York City, it's a term associated with New York City. And you don't see that, as you point out, Bruce, uh, it's much more known for the other New York City, New York City sports uh, franchises like basketball than it is for baseball. Um, but uh, definitely a New York term. Very good. Uh, final question from Tom. Uh, Tom, I'm not going to attempt your last name because it's beyond my abilities. But um, Tom wants to know, with a somewhat recent discovery of Doc Adams and his laws of baseball, are there any plans to update this exhibit down the line? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So, um, we, there's been discovered, and they're now in, in private hands, um, original hand notations from a guy named Doc Adams. Doc Adams was, the, um, was involved with the Knickerbocker Club, and there's a push to have him get inducted into the Hall of Fame, along with Alexander Cartwright, who's already in the Hall of Fame. And um, those handwritten kind of rules, um, it comes from that first convention in New York City where they're trying to figure out what, what's going to be, what are going to be the rules of the game that we're going to all play by, right? Mm -hmm. So these are, the, these are his handwritten notations to the rules that become the rules that come out of the first, the first um, convention of ball players. And um, it is something that, of course, you know, it really just feeds into the Knickerbocker story because we know that they exist now. Um, there's a chance to try to retell that part of the story in this exhibit. It is 16 years old, so we might have to do a refresh. I do know the gentleman who owns uh, those, and um, we've had conversations in the past, perhaps, of uh, trying to incorporate them somehow. It's, it's, a, it's pretty complicated because documents that are old, we really don't like to display anything. We wouldn't display it if we owned it, um, but is there a way to figure out how we can incorporate the story that that's telling and, and um, into this exhibit? Um, that's something that we should look at doing. So I like that question. Again, right, it's something where um, that happened in 1858, and yet um, it's a story that's really just of the last couple of years where them kind of being rediscovered. Um, so, you know, history gets rewritten or rediscovered, should I say. Perry Barber informs us that one of Doc Adams' descendants is in on the Zoom call, Marjorie Adams. Uh, Marjorie is a huge baseball fan, a Facebook friend of mine, so we thank Marjorie for joining yeah. us. Hi, Eric, Marjorie. Thank you for being with us as well to talk about uh, this exhibit, uh, ever evolving as we learn about the history of baseball back in the 19th century and before. Again, the exhibit is taking the field the 19th century. Uh, when our museum reopens, um, hopefully sometime soon, perhaps coming up uh, in uh, these summer weeks and months ahead of us, uh, we want you to make sure to stop by on the second floor and check out Taking the Field. Eric, thanks again. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Bruce. Uh, thanks for everybody who watched, and uh, I wish we could all be spending this time together in the museum. Soon, though, that will be happening. So um, we can only hope. So to all of those out there that we know that are friends of the hall, can't wait to see you. Uh, and for those who haven't been, please come and uh, look at the unbelievable treasures that we have to offer in person. You know, this is awfully a remote way to do this. We've been uh, used to doing this, I think, the last several months now um, with our lives. 
Um, but museums are a place where you can get up close to see things. And I think that we all can't wait to, to have that happen in Cooperstown. So um, hello to everybody out there. Thanks for, for, for participating and watching. And uh, we'll hope to see you soon. Bruce, thanks again, as always. Thank you, Eric. We, we will reopen at some point. It's just a matter of when. It's, it's coming up. We'll just uh, figure out exactly what month and what day. want to remind you about some upcoming virtual programs this week. Uh, tomorrow, which is March 27th, uh, we will be featuring our weekly virtual field trip on baseball and labor history. Uh, that one is particularly good, not just for kids, but also for adults. That's at 11 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Uh, and then on Friday, another great guest coming up is Virtual Voices of the Game with Ben Mankiewicz of Turner Classic Movies. He'll reveal to us his favorite baseball film uh, and talk about the general history of baseball movies. Ben is a huge baseball fan, uh, grew up as a fan of the Oakland A's, still follows the franchise to this day. And that's coming up Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thanks again to everybody for joining us. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the program. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.